so I'm Brett Cunningham. I work, uh, did work in the incident response, now do cyber intelligence. And uh, I was introduced to memory analysis about a year ago or so, a little bit over. And at first I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Um, some of these guys in here uh, I've worked with and they can tell you it was uh, pretty pitiful. I was given a memory dump um, during one incident and was told to run strings against it, <laughs> ran strings. It was uh, compressed by uh, HB Gary, um, their memory dump tool, and got nothing back and was just scratching my head trying to figure out you know, what was going on. Come to find out, I was just doing it all wrong. <laughs> um, so since then, I've really dedicated a lot of time uh, to trying to understand what to do uh, with memory analysis and how it helps during incident response. It's really interesting the kind of things that you can get out of a memory dump that you either can't get from you know a full disk image or that you know a full disk image depending upon what part of the world the compromised box is in you might not get that image for weeks or months so the main tool that I like to use is called volatility. And what it does is goes through the memory dump, looking for uh, specific like, uh, data structures that are of interest. And we're gonna go through, take a look at some of the data structures and map it back to the incident response process and you'll see why that that's important. So, just to start off on what a data structure is, it's uh, it's like a grouping of variables that just kind of make up uh, you know one set of data. All right. So in the example that I've got here, uh, the structure, the data structure would be called movies. Okay. Inside there, you've got your string, which is uh, the title and actor. Those are two different variables that belong to the data structure of movies. You've got the integer, that is the year the movie came out, and um, the price, which is just a float. To declare a, um, a data structure, down at the bottom you see where it says movies Star Wars or movies Van Wilder. That's how you initiate a data structure. So one uh, data structure specifically would be you know, if you took Encino Man, um, that would be the uh, title of the movie. The actor, Pauly Shore, uh, year and price you got there. So, how that actually pertains to uh, um, incident response is that instead of going through and using strings like I was initially told, This would be using strings against the memory dump to look for uh, commands that an attacker has typed in. Here we see um, in a very unstructured manner uh, something of interest. Net time, um, I know I just did it against the local host here, but that would be something um, an attacker would do inside of your network. Going through here with just strings, we would end up having to create a dictionary of all those net use commands, net time, uh, ping, telnet, whatever an attacker could possibly do on your network, you'd have to build up uh, you know, just a small file of that and have to grab against you know, uh, the string's output of this. Instead of doing that, we get the pleasure of working with volatility that goes through and looks for data structures. One example would be what's called the ConScan plugin. So just to use volatility, it's a it's just a couple Python scripts, um, a little bit more than that, but uh, that you invoke, and then you pass it the plugin that 
you want to scan against the memory dump. So we'll go with This is the massive amount of plugins that uh, are available right now. And we're taking a look right now at the ConScan plugin. Right. Here you see all the connections that are uh, residing in memory. and the process ID that it belongs to. Earlier, I just talked about the net time command. We can go through and use command scan. This one goes and looks at any, uh, any data structure that has, uh, okay, so anytime that you type something on the Windows command prompt, that uh, information is thrown into a data structure and as long as you know not enough time has passed or that memory hasn't been overwritten you should get it in the uh, command or in the memory dump so command scan will tell us uh, like right here we see the attacker used telnet used FTP and then the attacker which would really just be me obviously uh, dump the memory to be able to analyze it. But going through with uh, strings, we would have had to go and already had pre-populated, you know, a word file and look at, uh, try and key off of any telnet, FTP, net uh, commands. And that's just absolutely miserable. actually looking at what a real uh, data structure looks like. This console information here is what the, uh, the consoles plugin looks for. Consoles is very close to um, command scan and we'll take a look at that. But here you can see uh, A little bit better. All right, here you can see where the title of the, uh, the window is, the uh, command history size. You see all of those uh, variables that relate to uh, the console information. So consoles here is a little bit more interesting than command scan, purely in the fact that it gives you the results back that you entered in the command and it will show you that data that has come back. Um, so when I ran that net time command earlier, you see that I messed up. All right, and you see the results that came back from, um, from the command prompt. Right here, when I did a directory listing, you know, you see everything that's in that directory. So consoles really helps provide a lot more context in that situation of what the attacker would have seen. One other interesting plugin is called Timeliner. Timeliner here will it will go through and look for all of these uh, timestamps of uh, different data structures. So, like in the if you want to do like a process listing. Um, that goes through and looks for the e-process data structure. And in there, uh, the process timestamp um, of when the process was created, uh, will, Timeliner will go in and extract it. 
and thread timestamps, that will also go in to any threads and pull out those timestamps. You see here we've also got uh, the registry key last write times. So if any malware tries to change um, a registry key, it will, um, the timeliner will report that back. Right here we've got a pretty simple format. It gives you the timestamp that it was able to extract it from. Uh, right here is the um, actual data structure that it's looking for. So here we've got process. Uh, a little bit further down we've got socket. Uh, and one cool one is the Windows event log. You know that Windows event log, you know, really only lasts in memory for not very long at all. Um, but it's really interesting to still have that. And then, uh, depending upon you know, what data structure is being extracted out, here you've got the process um, and PID information, uh, Windows event log, you actually had uh, what it was gonna write to the Windows, uh, event, um, the Windows event log. So one really interesting plugin is called Malfind. Has anyone here worked with Malfind? I think it was uh, in the Malware Anna's cookbook. And what it does is it goes through and looks for pages in memory that are of interest. And we'll go through and define why that's of interest. But I'm going to use Volatility's Vol Shell. And that's a lot like WinDebug. So we can go through and do a process listing. With PS, it'll just go through and list all the processes that were active during um, the memory dump. All right. If we want to change the context to a certain process and actually start uh, looking at the characteristics that make up that process, we just enter in CC. And we're going 1096. Yeah, I actually changed that up. <coughs> All right, so we changed the process to the process ID of 1076. And we can start taking a look at um, the interesting, the interesting uh, data that pertains to that process. So we'll go ahead and just take a look at what the eProcess data structure looks like. And at any time you can do that by entering in DT and passing it the data structure you want to look for. So in this case it's going to be eProcess. And here we have things like create uh, time. So knowing when you know malware started up in memory might be helpful, especially if it's in like C Windows um, System 32. If that did not start with you know a lot of the other ones that legitimately would have started at that time, it, that's going to be a process you want to take a look into. It's not a live system? No. So what I have here is I'm running it against this memory dump right here. Okay, and I infected this box with poison ivy and ran uh, Moon Souls Win 32 DD, and now I'll go through and just dump all RAM. Um, great program to use. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at, if we call self.eproc, that will actually, self meaning the current context 
the current uh, process that we're taking a look at. And it will fill in all those values of the e-process data structure with that specific process's data. So here we see that the create time was um, 2012-09-27. So then we start getting into, since we're talking about Malfine, we're going to talk about the virtual address descriptor, which is called the VAD. All right. What the VAD is, is it's the memory of a process that's actually being used. When, when a programmer goes and says, for this program, I need you know, X amount of memory. Windows does not immediately allocate that memory. It waits until uh, the program actually references that memory and then creates it. So each process will have its own VAD. And the VAD looks like a tree structure if you hang a tree upside down. So you have your VAD root, and then it just branches out into a list. And you'll see that here. So there's two different types of data structures that um, creating uh, that are related to the VAD. We're going to take a look at the MMVAD short. And you see that the it will have a number of different members in it, tag being one of them. Tag describes what kind of VAD it is. This being VAD S is a VAD short. All right. And the structure I'm talking about, the tree structure, is defined right here. You see left child and right child. That is referencing, it's a pointer to another area in memory that contains another VAD. So because this gets really long, we just end up putting VAD root. Uh, yeah, we called VAD root in the previous uh, line. This one we're going to assign it into a variable. And just work from it work with it from there. So we're going to call this processes, we're going to call the processes VAD roots right child. And nothing special here except, you know, you see the data values change. This is how you navigate the VAD tree system, all right, for a process. And you see, I'm not going to do these because last time it didn't really help that much but just seeing the um, the commands itself you see that you can keep navigating by doing right child right child so it'll be that right child's right child and you can go left child right child um, but that's you know how you meander through so when we looked at the data structure for that bad system, you see this U. So we can go ahead and call that U. And right now, um, you see that long bad and bad flags belong to U. And what ends up happening is uh, <coughs> Malfind will go through looking at the VAD flags, it will look at uh, the type, the, like the tag, um, and it will look at any kind of memory protections that are on those uh, memory pages. And the VAD is describing those memory pages. It'll go traverse the VAD tree for each process or the process that you give it and look for the protection level of six. Now, the protection level of six is specifically interesting because when doing process injection um, like Poison Ivy does or you can configure Poison Ivy to, um, it will 
end up creating. Wow, this is bad. All right, you'll get this uh, page execute read write, which here you see 04, and uh, there's another uh, residual, like, you know, just characteristic of uh, virtual alloc ex where it will add two more to that constant. So it ends up becoming very unique in that you have this read, write, execute of this page in memory. So when you do process injection, you have to uh, throw your code up into a process's memory space, and it has to be executable for you know, the process to actually run. So virtual alloc EX leaves this characteristic of the protection of that uh, memory page being a six. So Malfine will go through and look for any protection levels of six, which gives you that page execute read write. Right. The other interesting thing is that virtual alloc EX um, is usually of bad uh, S, which is just uh, the short one that we were specifically looking at. So, any questions over Malfine? All right, I know that was a lot, but there's one last thing I'll show you um, with Malfine, and that you can run a very simple uh, bash loop to go through, because um, Malfine will dump out uh, those pages in memory into uh, a directory that you give it, and it'll have all these dumps. To go in there and just do a loop over all the files that are in there, you can see what kind of uh, file it is. If it has, um, if it's an executable file, it should say, you know, it's a Windows executable file. Then you can go in and inspect that page. and see, you know, is there the beginning of uh, the MS-DOS stub if it's in there, or even if this is executable code. And the last thing I'm going to show you today, which is um, really cool, Volatility is doing this month of Volatility plugins, where they're trying to launch a plugin every day. The coolest one, I, I still have time to, or still need some time to go through a lot of those plugins, but the coolest one I've seen so far is, it's called Sessions, and it goes through and tries to map up processes to the RDP session that it belongs to. And you'll see here that I have, oops, wrong one. You'll see here that I have two sessions that um, have been created on this box. Up here, you have session zero, as defined right there, because um, it says ID zero. You see all the processes that belong to it. And then down here, you see uh, sessions two and three. And because that this is just a regular Windows XP box, I believe that's why um, you'll see I did, I actually RDP'd into this box and I issued a couple of commands on the command line. Now, because it's a regular Windows XP box, you'll see that the command.exe is under session zero, which is that console session, as if you're actually in front of the box typing those commands in. Um, and session three here was the actual RDP session. One last uh, thing of note is that this VMX uh, FBDLL is an artifact that just shows you that this is going to be a virtual machine. Um, <laughs> And that's, that's basically it. So 
Any questions? How good is volatility documentation? I mean, have been using it. They've been using it as a like source of learning using the volatilities on documentation or another source. All right. The the question is how what's the quality of volatilities documentation? If you're want to if you're looking at it specifically for like incident response, um, no, no. Uh, their blog is great. Um, each person's like each of the people that actually do uh, the contributors um, and the authors of the tools do great blog posts too. Um, I think it's uh, the malware analyst cookbook touches on you know how to use it for incident response. Uh, so that's the way that I've learned and through a little trial and error and a lot of reading you know um, the developers documentation is fantastic so uh, any other questions so Cloud and Ham, will you be posting a guide on your blog a guide on how to use volatility yes um, I do go through and talk about it every once in a while but uh, no there will be no comprehensive guide <laughs> Uh, one, one question. Yeah. Uh, right. So, um, out of all the memory analysis tools you use, you you, you like volatility um, over HP Gary's responder. Um, so I, I noticed it's not one Yeah. The the question is, there's different memory analysis tools out there, um, and why do I like volatility? I haven't really re played with Responder Pro much, to be honest. Um, that's one that he specifically asked about. It's, uh, I don't know, it's a lot of money, uh, from my understanding. Um, I, volatility's been working for me volatility so far. Volatility is free. Responder costs money. Yeah. I mean, that's a great point. Volatility is free. So I was able just to download it and play around with it, and I haven't hit something that I want to do in volatility that I can't do or that they're not working on. So I haven't had the need to pay a lot of money for something I can do for free. So, any other questions? All right, thank you guys very much for attending.